I get it right. City Council District Seven. District Seven. Uh, and he's going to be speaking for 15 to 20 minutes, and then we're going to be followed by another very important guest speaker, Kim Stoffler, President of Firearm Owners Against Crime. Uh, wave, Kim. Yes, sir. He's uh, he's one of the the head. Well, he is the head of Firearm Owners Against Crime, which is a very big deal. It's kind of like uh, the NRA, but local. You know, so and you, he's right here for you to talk to. Uh, anybody after the meeting, please feel free to say to uh, ask lots of questions and just get involved. So, there you go. All right. Hi, folks. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming out here. I'd like to... Uh, Thank Mr. Tally for uh, organizing this event and um, and running for sheriff, and getting signatures and getting on the ballot. That was uh, that's a tough thing to do. I'm a special election, so I was able to just uh, do a candidate aff affidavit, which I would say I would like to just before I even get started say that anybody in the Allegheny County area, if there's a special election, if a uh, politician gets thrown in jail or quits or gets elected to some other position, and there's a special election. Just come talk to me, and it's really easy. You just fill out a just fill out a candidate affidavit, and boom, you're on the ballot. You don't have to do any of the petitions. You don't have to get challenged like Mr. Barr over here just went through and was victorious. By the way, congratulations, Jim. That was really easy. because what happens is uh, the GOP always challenges the Libertarians and the Constitution Party uh, petitions, and the Democrats always challenge the Green Party petitions, and um, unfortunately, they're often successful. I don't know if a lot of you folks know, but um, in uh, <clears throat> Pennsylvania, we have partisan judges, and one of the things that can happen is they, there's been a, in uh, the Carl Romanelli decision, back when Ralph Nader ran, the judge decided to assign the legal fees to the losing party, which is just awful, because they can just get a $1,000 an hour lawyer. They Basically, they extort us off the ballot. They say, oh, you know, we're about $90,000, $100,000 in legal fees. If you guys lose, you have to pay it. And it's you personally, not just your campaign coffers. So special elections and getting on the ballot this way is a very important and very effective way to, uh, to get out there. So. If I just wanted to get that word out. It's not really part of my speech, but uh, just wanted to get the word out to you guys that if, if uh, there is a special election in any of your uh, areas, you can come talk to me, fill out two papers, get it out, get it notarized, send it in, and you're on the ballot. Then you can do the fun stuff, like come here and talk to big groups of people when you're, you're campaigning. Um, so uh, to get started then, um, I was born in the South Hills of Whitehall. I graduated from Baldwin and uh, University of Pittsburgh with a degree in information technology. Um, I've worked at Pitt since 1995. I live in Morningside. Um, if you, you guys know, that's by the zoo in Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm not a politician, and I don't want to be one. I'm here because I refuse to allow my children to be sold up the river into a taxation vortex. I refuse to allow our fair city to become like Detroit. Somehow we've been allowed this, this amazing national economic engine to be hijacked into doing things that most of us don't want. And uh, I stand before you in a humble effort to try to set things right. Uh, last thing we need is another politician that knows the players and can get things done, or another son of a politician. Uh, we've had a number of those, and uh, there are several in jail right now as we speak. So uh, it's far too easy for money to connected interests to insert themselves into the legislation process. That's why I say to get the money out of politics, you need to get the power out of politics. Uh, the power to pick winners and losers, the power to selectively enforce rules and regulations, uh, the power to direct massive amounts of funds to cronies for the public good. So, <coughs> in my race, there's an endorsed uh, candidate from the Democrats. Uh, I'm sure she's a perfectly capable manager and a fundraiser. Um, but I feel that this background, I don't know if you know she is, she's dead gross. No policy positions whatsoever has been put out. She's just a very nice person that you should vote for uh, because Bill Peduto says so. Um, <coughs> But I feel this background uh, being considered a good thing represents a flawed understanding of the problem. Um, our city has way too much going for it uh, to suffer this much. I, again, I'm from Pittsburgh. I know you guys are mostly from out here. Uh, you know, we're doing something wrong. Uh, a lot of these problems are of our own design, just poor decisions that our government officials have made. You know, it's not like, uh, you know, we got a big flood and got wiped out or a tornado came through and tore up the town and we have to rebuild and it's going to cost billions of dollars. We're just dumping money out the door for really no good reason. You know, uh, 
So we shouldn't be standing around with our hands out to, to Harrisburg and Washington. You know, I don't want our city's business plan to be to get better at fundraising or securing fun, you know, funding from you know, Uncle Sugar. You know, we don't need fundraisers in city government. You know, we need leaders. So, uh, you know, the city, I don't know if you guys are aware, but uh, we've been under what's called Act 47 um, for a number of years now. Um, and normally I'm very much in favor of local control, uh, you know, but the city council has made a gigantic mess of that. So, you know, I'd support staying under Act 47 until we're out of the woods. A lot of people are, there's a lot of rumblings in the city now about getting out from under Act 47. Um, and I think, you know, it's working so far, so I think we should, uh, you know, stick with it. We must move to a, a defined contribution 401k style retirement plan for public unions. Uh, you know, this isn't an option. This, uh, the, the, the mathematics just does not work. You know, if we do not go to a defined contribution <coughs> system for public unions, we will absolutely go bankrupt eventually. Maybe sooner, maybe later. I don't know if some of you guys know, uh, in the 1970s, uh, there were times that there was actually zero dollars in the Pittsburgh public pension funds. Zero. That's just amazing. And to think that, you know, we're going to continue to add on people onto these roles and they're only about 60% funded, it's just crazy. Another thing that they're doing too with the, with the pensions is they're assuming an 8% return. Who here is getting an 8% safe return on their investments? It doesn't exist anymore. Three and a half is, is the safe return on investments. So the, the problem is already twice as big, twice you know, as large as even the bad reports that are coming out now uh, say it is. So, you know, with pension costs under control, we would be able to support much more city services and, you know, put more police officers on the street, non-militarized police officers, I should say. You know, but we all like local police officers. I mean, you know, nobody, uh, I know we have a uh, came here from Firearm Owners Against Crime, but nobody wants to have to, you know, defend themselves with a firearm. It's much better if the uh, cops can get those guys off the street before it, it gets that bad. Now, I can hear the union reps you know, in some uh, uh, places that I've been, could hear them tapping out nasty grams on their phones, on their Facebook, you know, talking about moving uh, to a 401k pension style plan. But, you know, here's the thing. Yes, unions, public unions, you'll get paid when the cities suck the states dry, the states go to Uncle Sam, you know, who can print the cash to pay you. Well, what's that money going to be worth? You know, there's trillionaires in Zimbabwe, but all they could buy was a handful of eggs. So, you know, it's, it's uh, a matter of... Um, getting a promise that's actually going to be fulfilled or a promise that's going to be fulfilled but it's not going to be worth anything. So I would encourage you know, public union people to, to consider that. So uh, let's see. One of the other things I'm, uh, I'm uh, going against is, uh, I don't know if that's such a big deal out here in, in the, the, the outside of Allegheny County, but uh, TIFs, the uh, tax increment financing, do you guys have much of those out here? I don't know. Anyway. They declared, uh, if you're familiar, um, in uh, Shady Side. People know where Shady Side is. It's a nice area of town. They declared part of it blighted, so that they could bring in development dollars, uh, you know, and give a, a tax incentive to uh, the developers. But here's the thing: you favor some developers over all the others, and then the other developers will decide not to compete. Uh, you know, the favored developers will use the money that they get to. Uh, to get more pull, to contribute to more campaigns and, and more politicians. And so then no developer will come near Pittsburgh at all unless they're given a TIF. Or, they, or if they do, they risk getting a, some kind of a TIF uh, finance competitor halfway through their build. So, you know, I feel that, you know, government should not uh, treat the city like Sim City, you know, where there's no penalty for messing things up. You know, uh, for instance, uh, Mayor Murphy, he, uh, brought in Lazarus. I'm sure a lot of you folks are familiar with the Lazarus development. Went belly up after a few years. They, uh, they, they said to Lazarus, you don't have to pay any taxes unless you make a certain amount of money. But this certain amount of money was more than they'd ever made at any other of their stores ever. So what kind of sense does that make? You know, it was just, it was dead from the start. Now, Mayor Murphy is now a uh, uh, associate honcho at, uh, at some nonprofit. Now, actually, I think it's an Agenda 21 related uh, nonprofit. Do you guys know that Pittsburgh has an Agenda 21 like office? I don't have much else on that, but I just, there's something in my research I've come across. They actually have an official Agenda 21 implementation office. 
and there's a constellation of nonprofits around it. And ex Mayor Murphy is uh, actually, you know, uh, associate something or other, you know, there. So, thing is, Mayor Murphy didn't suffer due to the failure of his pro project. You know, some of them were successful, but you know, government people are not developers. Developers are developers. You know, it actually is their job to thoroughly analyze a build deal. You know, government developers, I mean, you know, what do they want to do? What are they trying to do? They're trying to spread the money around, you know, developing all the areas equally, putting money in poor areas. I mean, it all sounds good. I mean, it looks good on paper even. But, you know, it was really death by a thousand cuts. You know, we really need to put money, you know, any project that's not sustainable, it's not going to be sustainable. It's going to eventually fail or it's going to be an anchor you know, an economic anchor dragging us all down with higher and higher taxation. So, let me go over here. So, one of the one of the um, policies that I would uh, advocate, and probably would have, a, I think some of you, I know I've had discussions with Mr. Barr about this a couple times, but um, a uh, land value tax. Uh, so, in my opinion, we should move more to a land value tax instead of taxing the structure. Uh, no, uh, several noted economists have said it's the least bad tax. Uh, you know, when you tax something, you get less of it. For instance, they, you know, left it's already always taxed. You know, booze and cigarettes, oh, we'll get them people to stop smoking, um, you know, stop drinking. But, you know, if people actually did stop smoking and drinking, the state would be, you know, having a really hard economic time because they get a lot of money from that. Um, so, you know, I think that's a, that's a poorly designed uh, taxation idea. I don't know if you guys know, but uh, Mayor Ravenstall actually floated an idea to uh, tax the tuition of Pitt students. That's just crazy. Uh, you know, we want less students. You know, we want less people. We're, you know, we're always wringing our hands about, oh, how can we get people to stay in the area? Well, if they don't come to the area to begin with, you know, that's... that's you know, that's not uh, going to be a good thing. You're not even, you wouldn't even be driving them away to other universities. They could just go to Johnstown campus or Greensburg campus, you know. So that was just a, an idiotic taxation idea. Uh, you know, income tax. Do we want people to earn less? You know, payroll taxes. Do we want people to uh, want less jobs? So, you know, the land value taxes means that it's more expensive to hold the land out of productive use uh, so that we'll have less of that which is actually something we do want. I mean, probably you guys who live out here in the other counties probably don't have this as much as, as we do in the city, but in the city there's, you know, not, you know, formerly nice houses that have been empty for 10 years, empty lots and so forth. Um, oh, okay, do better. Uh, you know, so it's, it'll cost more for speculators uh, to hold this land out of productive use. Also, one of the things is uh, UPMC and, and some of the other big nonprofits have been buying up large chunks of land and I think using it kind of as their personal piggy bank, since they're not allowed to like make a profit, they say, oh, we might build a clinic here, and they hold this land for a generation out of use, and whenever they need some money, they can just go ahead and sell it and lock in the capital gains. Um, you know, if you tax the structure, it, uh, it incentivizes slumlordism, you know, because they don't want to put any money into it. So I think if you shift just a few percentage points back to the value of the land itself, it would uh, encourage more of the, of the uh, land to be uh, put to productive use. So uh, I got the two minutes. Let me uh, go on to what you guys probably want to hear more about is um, police. I'm against the militariz militarization of police. Um, for instance, I have an article here that Dallas County, this is just from today, now has its very own bulletproof, mine-protected, Military SUV. I'm against all these kind of uh, transfers of military equipment to um, the local police forces. I'm against the militarization. I never want to see experimental weaponry used on civilians like it was in Lawrenceville, my district, in uh, 2009 during the G20. Uh, that is just a horrendous thing, and I think you know we need to uh, we need to make sure that this doesn't happen. Um, the I would like to end a drug war. I would like to. Uh, I would uh, sponsor a bill to direct the mayor, to direct the chief of police, a little bit indirect, but to reduce uh, nonviolent marijuana offenses to the lowest uh, enforcement um, priority. Just as a, an example of how much this is costing us, um, oh, by the way, prescription drugs now kill more in the U.S. than heroin and cocaine combined. This is from a couple years ago. Uh, so, you know, we've got, we're, got doctors giving out prescriptions and they're killing more people than the, the quote-unquote bad drugs. 
this is county, this isn't city, but $480,000 in overtime pay, just overtime pay, to transport inmates for medical care. That's $2,232 per inmate from the county jail over to the hospitals. In Pittsburgh in 2010, there were 250 arrests a month for drug possession, 2,907 total in 2010. And that is more than the 2,717 assault arrests, 19% of all arrests. And you know, there's a racial component to this too. 898 white males arrested, 1,480 black males arrested. You know, uh, so let's save the SWAT teams and jail for actual violent criminals. You know, that's what that's you know, that's what they're there for. And you know, when they're letting people out of jail, uh, violent people out of jail, just because their stuff's so full of all of the uh, drug offenders. Again, you know, 200 more drug offenders than actual assault uh, have been arrested. Nonviolent is what I'm talking about again. But you know, oh, also one last thing before I uh, before I move on here, um, privacy issues. I've been reasonably well assured that the camera footage from security cameras in the city of Pittsburgh is pretty hard to get to. Uh, it's, it's pretty tough to be abused, uh, from what I understand. However, it just came out last Sunday that the parking enforcement vehicles, they have like a $20,000 camera set up and they snap all the license plates to see if you have a bunch of tickets and need to get a boot. Okay, that's enforcement. You know, that's fair. You know, ticket scoff laws exist. However, they make all the, that whole database available for 30 days. Um, you can file a right to know request. Now, I do have to say, I, I appreciate the Pittsburgh Parking Authority taking right to know laws, uh, right to know requests seriously, and actually fulfilling them. That's a good thing. But why are they even storing this data for 30 days? Uh, so, you know, people will say, oh, if you don't have anything to uh, worry about, if you're not doing anything wrong, you don't have anything to worry about. Uh, that's absolutely not true. Uh, you know, there's plenty of deranged people, uh, jealous ex spouses, and so forth that could, uh, in, you know, invade your privacy and threaten your safety over this. So uh, I would like to, uh, if uh, elected to council, I would uh, investigate that, have a uh, support a bill to, uh, to change that policy, and I would also investigate what, ha what is done with the parking kiosks that you put in your license plate number, and, uh, and also what happens, uh, there's a swipe card on the PAP buses now. I'd like to make sure that we're not tracked by those kind of uh, mechanisms. I would stand against all license plate scanners, stationary license plate scanners, facial recognition, and all these kind of uh, big brother control state uh, apparatus. So um, I imagine I'm about out of time now. So uh, thank you all once again for having me here, and I appreciate it. And uh, if anyone uh, lives in City Council District 7, I ask for your vote. Vote for Powell. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. My wife says I have a big mouth. <laughs> uh, my name is Kim Stolfer, and I'm going to explain to you tonight what we do, what we've done, why we do it, and why this race is so important to us and should be to you, and how to make a difference. I got involved in the gun rights issue beginning back in the late 80s. Uh, the reason I did was because as a United States Marine from 1972 to 1976, partly in Vietnam, I saw what governments can do as a young man. I saw some things that I didn't like that other governments could do. And I'm sure we don't have to look too far in today's headlines to see what our current government is doing. And many of you would take exception to some of it. Benghazi was a turning point for me personally. Letting our troops die when you had help really bothered me. Giving guns to Mexican gang members in Fast and Furious bothered me. But as far as what we do, you should know why. Every pro-gun measure that's been introduced in Pennsylvania since I've been involved came from the local and state groups. Not one came from the National Rifle Association. I don't say that to disparage them. I'm a life member. I want to 
encourage you to realize that each one of you possesses this kind of power. The license to carry firearms program and law came from us. The Castle Doctrine Law, which I in part wrote with two other friends of mine, came from us. Kim, who's us? Us as Firearms Owners Against Crime, there you go. the Allegheny County Sportsman's League, and grassroots groups helped us all across the state. I could tell you a lot more of our accomplishments, but that's not why I'm here tonight. But what I am here to tell you is about how you can make a difference and why it's so important. In the exercise of the License to Carry Firearms program, every sheriff has a role. Our current sheriff seems to not be able to read well, to say the least. Bill Mullen has had so many visits from me that I just got a free pass to walk into his office. And usually the first thing that he heard from me was, now Bill, you know you can't do this. Okay? The reason is, is I'll give you an example. Imagine you're a new lieutenant, a young woman who just got out of language school, and she's being transferred down to Florida. <clears throat> we have, we had up until this goofball we have for Attorney General now, we had a reciprocity agreement with Florida that made sense. They still recognize our permit. But according to Bill Mullen, she hadn't been back in the area in time to get a permit. There's nothing in the law that gives him that authority. <coughs> so I went and sat in front of him. Finally, he had to call his solicitor. And this young woman had to take three days leave to come here because we had a sheriff didn't know what he was doing. Now, I want you to think about this. When, when I'm done talking, I'm nobody special, but the people I represent in Firearms Owners Against Crime, in the ACSL, and the pro-gun people across this state, they are. They've worked hard and tirelessly for you and for this state's history and what we believe is best for the public policy. When you go home, when you look in a mirror, I want you to think about this. Two things. What does freedom mean to you? What does freedom mean to you? And what are you prepared to do to help restore a little bit of it? How many hours can you provide? Can any of you say, guys, I'm going to challenge you. It's a Steeler country. You watch a Steeler game. Between now and Election Day, three hours of your time. Turn off one game. You're not going to miss nothing. They can't block for crap, let me tell you. <laughs> but this young man deserves your time. Because otherwise, we're going to be saddled with a sheriff that denies permits, that intrudes upon people's lives, and reshapes them. Do you know you can have a permit denied in that office because of a parking ticket? An unpaid parking ticket? That's not in the law. Many sheriffs across this state enforce the regulations the state police wrote that are illegal. They require references. Now, on the surface, you don't think about that much. References. Okay, I'll put down a couple of friends. But it's the law. The sheriff is supposed to be the highest law enforcement officer in his jurisdiction. He's supposed to be. And the state police, the people who wrote the regulations that are illegal, are working to undermine the office and did through the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court. That case should have been taken to the federal courts, and it wasn't. Still can be, though. But the sheriffs in this state need to band together. And you never will with a sheriff sitting in there like Bill Mullen. Nice guy. 37-year veteran of the Pittsburgh Police Force. Got friends on the Pittsburgh Force and in the sheriff's office. Let's just say 
Christmas cards don't flow from those guys to his office or his house. So we have a sheriff that doesn't know the law or won't act on the law the way his office dictates, doesn't pay his troops, his deputies properly, doesn't handle the law properly, and believes he can get away with this because it's part of the good old boy network. Well, let's take a look at what it takes to get elected. Of all of the registered voters in Allegheny County, you have how many people that will turn out for this election? Give me a guess. Come on. Somebody tell me. How many do you think is going to turn out at the end of the... 30%. The, uh, huh? 30%. 30%. 30%? 13. Percentages. What do you think? Uh, 13? 10. 10. 10. Okay. I'll tell you what. Let's give him the benefit of that and say 20, <laughs> just for argument's sake. But you're right. I think you're closer to it than anything. Um, say 20%, which means you need 11% of the registered voters to put this young man in office. 11%. That means if you get all your friends together to vote, every one of them that votes is like eight votes for Mike. Eight votes. That's what controls our government. These kind of popularity contests. In the average race for state rep, there's 65,000 possible constituents or constituents out there. But out of the people that vote, only between 11 and 14,000 people control your vote in the state house. But this man, this office, the sheriff, is so important because he can even tell the feds to go away. They do that out west. And that's the reason the state police wanted control. And, by the way, the Pennsylvania Association of Chiefs of Police want the same. And I'm not kidding. I can prove it if you want. I have a lot of documents. Showed Mike some of these. We sat down and talked. I've been doing this for over 30 years. And I'm here to tell you, by the way, I'm not paid to do this. Okay? And I just want to show you that I am carrying a firearm and the prejudices that exist in our country and in our state makes people believe that now this gun's safe because they don't know about it. <laughs> oh, well, gee, that piece of fabric's going to stop a bad guy, right? <laughs> the reason why I show you this is because I've earned this right as a United States Marine. But every one of you have this birthright too. And if we don't stand up and start taking charge of elections, and we have an opportunity here that rarely comes because they don't see this young man coming, we can turn the tide on these people. But if we don't stand up, they're serious about taking stuff away from us. Just yesterday I was at the pre-homecoming uh, event out in Washington Jefferson College. I sat there, I was one of the panelists for the law school, believe it or not. And if I was asked once, I was asked a dozen, asked a dozen times, how can you sit there and say about freedom? I ask you, what does freedom mean to you? I ask every politician and every candidate for office the same thing. Because believe it or not, these are all yours. If I came over, I come over. If I came over to you and I said, I want $10 out of your wallet, I'll give you five back. What did you get for it? Right. That's the version of governmental compromise. But sheriff's offices can change the paradigm on them because they're the great equalizer. So can state legislators if they, well, there's ladies present. I can't say what a Marine would. Uh, I think you get the message. They have to really step up to the plate and get some courage. Uh, there's other ways to say it. How many military veterans are here, by the way? Thank you for your service. Did any of you relinquish your oath of office, your oath, to get in the military? I didn't. Didn't that say support and defend the Constitution from what? 
all enemies, foreign and domestic. If someone violates their oath and someone doesn't follow the law, are they a friend or enemy of the Constitution, which is the highest law in our state? They're an enemy. Now, granted, there's different ways of handling enemies. Marine Corps, they taught us one way, which probably isn't the first stop. <laughs> but we have the opportunity coming up to make that, the election, the first stop for one of them. Next year, we've got to make a lot more changes. But I'll settle for this one right here. Because Firearms Owners Against Crime, which I have the privilege and honor of being the president of, will be there with Mike. But he needs foot soldiers. He needs help. And it's drudgery, and it's difficult, and it's time consuming. And I know it's the hardest thing in the world to step up. And I know you wouldn't be here if you weren't supporting the young man. So I guess what I'm saying is buy a length of rope, go out and choke your friends, and get them involved too. <laughs> OK? <laughs> because in the end, it's all we have left is each other. Or we have tyranny. And for me, I will never acquiesce to that. Semper Fidelis is what I am. It's who I am. I hope you can step forward and grab a chunk of that and take a little bit extra and get out there for that young man. Thank you for your time.
we, we happen to live in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which predates the U.S. Constitution by 70 years. So in my hot little hand here, I have a Constitution that's 70 years older than the original U.S. Constitution that 95% of all people know about. And, and the interesting thing about it is every Constitution of every state is a little bit different, but this is the oldest. And you get a heck of a lot more definition out of it because as the years go by, there were two, two more... Uh, they, they redid the Pennsylvania Constitution twice and lost a lot of meaning. The original one states this for the... Uh, the Second Amendment, it's under Article 13, that the people have a right to keep and bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state, and that standing armies in the time of peace are dangerous, or are dangerous to, to liberty. They ought not to be kept up, and that the military should be kept under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. Okay, well, that, I mean, that has a lot of meaning. There's one, two, three, four, five, six lines in this. Two of the six lines talk about the right to keep and bear arms. The other four, the other two-thirds of this, talk about the dangers of a standing army being a liberty to a free society. So let's talk about that, okay, because that's half the Second Amendment right there. Um, and then, but first we'll take a little pause. I'll get into my background. So you know who I am and what I do, okay. Uh, my name is Mike Satelli. I'm 30 years old, uh, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, my whole life, uh, I have a very big, fam very big family name, and um, uh, most of which are doctors. I, I, I got 5,000 signatures in a month and three days personally just to get nominated for this position, and I'd say one out of ten actually recognized my name. But anyway, uh, I'm an Eagle Scout and an uh, Air Force Reservist at the 9-11th Airlift Wing, uh, one of the best bases in the United States Air Force. Um, I say that because they try to close my base down every three or four years, and uh, it's a real pain because we're the, actually the most cost-efficient base in the United States Air Force, and it, it just blows my mind while they try to close down the time. But anyway, I'm not here to talk about that. Uh, what I'm talking about is because I, you know, I, I want to, um, as an Oath Keeper, uh, support, and defend, support and defend the Constitution, and I want to do so here in Pennsylvania. Um, I brought to you a little educational PowerPoint, well, not a uh, little educational experience so that you can understand a little bit about the history that we have here, okay? Whenever... I talk about um, the Second Amendment. Uh, I, what I see, what disturbs me the most, is the militarization of police. Um, everything from state police officers to uh, local municipalities uh, and the military training, military weapons that they get, military training that they all have, and the military funding that they get is, is what I would consider a standing army. Now, the thing about the military and is that the only law about the military is that the military does not operate domestically inside the United States. It operates on foreign threats outside of the United States soil. And, um, but when I see what the police are doing, I see, I mean, really a militarization of police. And everybody that works in law enforcement or military will say that. Okay? It, it, it's pretty obvious right now. We have the Department of Homeland Security since after 9-11 happened. Uh, let me cue this up here. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, Hold on one sec. It's kind of hard to talk and do this at the same time. If I can't cue it up, I'll just talk. But the Department of Homeland Security The Department of Homeland Security in the last few years purchased about 1.6 billion rounds to be used domestically inside the United States. Um, the thing about it is they, they didn't just purchase any kind of ammo, they purchased hollow point rounds. Hollow point rounds are not to be used in the military because according to the Geneva Convention, uh, it's considered cruel and unusual punishment. So the Department of Homeland Security buys this and nothing quite much is said about it. But they do have congressional hearings on it, and then that's an issue. Um, also, they bought 2,717 MRAP tanks. Um, they don't need that. But I, I have all the links, all the information is there. I just can't queue it up right now. But uh, so I'm going to talk about, um, we'll get into the history of why it's an issue. Okay. 
Here's a little um, information about Rome and why their civilization fell. It was the biggest empire in the United States, or it was the biggest empire in the world. Um, the biggest rule of the Roman military, and this is right off Wikipedia, but the, big, the biggest rule about the military is that the military was never to be marched on inside the city itself. The reason why is because historically speaking, any time that happens, it's always used as a political tool. And it's used to, to control politics and government. And this is a story about um, ancient Rome, about the battle between Gaius Marius and Sulla. Gar Gaius Marius and Sulla for the first time marched their armies on the city and then in a fight Sulla killed all of Marius's supporters, kicked everybody out of the city and then controlled the world through, or controlled the city, all of Rome through his military. And then once that was established as a precedent, Julius Caesar kind of just picked up on it. But um, that, that's the whole point of the Second Amendment. Now, Sheriff Mack, who I had dinner with uh, two days ago, uh, he was in Westmoreland County for Jonathan Held and uh, some other places. He, uh, we had a nice lengthy, nice lengthy talk too about the history of the sheriff and how they protect and defend civil liberties, property, and it's a very big, it's a very big issue. Um, he wrote, um, the county sheriff, America's last hope, and the reason why is because he's the one person that was that defeated the Brady Bill, and you can see how important of a thing is whenever, you know, if you were to have, if you were to have an executive uh, government or a uh, federal government that steps out of bounds. Now, the thing that got me into this is because whenever all this stuff was happening after the Sandy Hook school shooting, um, there were about 300 sheriffs that, that didn't like what was going on with the executive order, but 33 of them sent letters to the White House that said that if Obama were to try to pass an executive order to confiscate firearms, not only would they not enforce it in their county, but if federal agents were sent into the county to try to enforce it, that they would be arrested with up to two years jail time. Unfortunately, uh, Bill Mullen for Allegheny County wasn't one of them. And uh, that's, one of the, that's one of the things that I want to I wanna do as far as my contribution to our civil liberties, that I will never allow gun confiscation as Sheriff of Allegheny County to ever happen. Uh, that's my work. And um, thank you. Now, an interesting thing is that Sheriff Mack didn't, didn't win in the Supreme Court for the Brady Bill against Clinton on the Second Amendment. That was actually a Tenth Amendment issue for uh, the right for the states to nullify federal law. Um, the whole point of it is, is that it's, it's a basic Tenth Amendment right that the states have, and it's all in the legislation, every right to overthrow the federal government. And there's, basically there's nothing that the federal government can't do to enforce federal law in the state if the state doesn't want to do it. We're the one that actually pays for it in the first place. So all that happens is the federal, like, you know, like, uh, if the federal money gives out grants, like a few million dollars to, to the police, the police say, oh, free money. It's, it's not free money. It's money that was taken from the state, redistributed from the federal government back to the state. <laughs> so it's our money in the first place. And we're funding it. Um, another thing that disturbs me is uh, the jail system that we have. In Allegheny County Jail, and uh, Dave was talking about that, here is actually a financial report from 2009 as far as the people that they arrest if it queues up. Ugh. But anyway, um, to make a long story short, if it won't queue up, uh, Click down on your cedar roll back in the There it is. Okay, here's a uh, here's a financial report as of 2009 for Allegheny County. And in it, if you scroll down, I mean, racism is a big deal in the United States because a lot of people get divided over it. And and I can tell you that if, if you know. One thing that we, we all need to start doing is we need to stop being divided and fighting over things like football, basketball, and race. What we have to do is we have to get united 
and stop worrying about it because we have a lot bigger issues to, to worry about. One of the things that's in our Allegheny County Jail, that if I'm sheriff of Allegheny County, I'm going to do something about it, is the nonviolent offenses for trumped up drug charges that are nonviolent. We have people serving jail time in Allegheny County for, for years on end for having a minor, minor drug possession. And if, if you approve of that or you don't because you like drugs or you, you're against drugs, that, that's fine. But what you need to understand is it's bigger than that because it costs you $38,000, $80,000 per inmate per year to put somebody in jail. Who cares about a marijuana cigarette? <laughs> this is one of the reasons why Allegheny County gets bankrupt. And the more money you just blow, I mean, the, you know, it, it's, it's going to tank the economy. If we don't stop wasting money, we're going to end up like Detroit. The stats for 2009, and the reason why is because they don't have 2013 on their website, but basically about 50% of all the inmates in jail are black. <coughs> Out of everybody in, in the Allegheny County Jail, about half, it's, it's about half and half, race and year. Now, African-Americans are like 13, 14% of the population. So, I mean, I want to make things fair and, and basically take, I'm not saying that, like, you know, anybody is going to get a get-out-of-jail-free card, but there's no way I'm going to let people in Allegheny County Jail on trumped-up drug charges for nonviolent offenses, <laughs> especially when it's costing the taxpayer. Um, we could effectively kick out a lot of, take out a lot of people that just don't need to be in jail and save a ton of money. Just something very simple. Very simply, you know, and um, God forbid we get a lot of people in jail, you know, that can work and get them jobs so that now they're working paying taxes. The economy ends up making more money in the end. So it's, you know, it's one of those things where stop throwing away money on, on, on the prison system, get people working again so that they can get back to their families, get back to paying taxes, and then everybody wins. But this is some of the stuff that goes on that um, I really want to talk about and shed light on because it affects everybody. Um, another thing that affects everybody, that I can't do anything, you know, as far as sheriff, but um, I'm also a 636 Teamster, and um, the things with, that's coming on with Obamacare, even our own president of the Teamsters Union, James Hoffa, is screaming bloody murder over what's going on with Obamacare because the Teamsters is one of the primary reasons Obama made it in office in the first place because the Teamsters gave millions of dollars to, uh, to campaign, mostly for health care. Um, it says here in James Hoffa's letter that he sent to the White House, this, he sent a few, like million, and, and I'm quoting James Hoffa in his letter, like millions of other Americans are members are frontline workers in the American economy. We have strong supporters of the notion that all Americans should have equal, should have access to uh, quality affordable health care. We have also been strong supporters of using campaign after campaign. We have put boots on the ground, gone door to door to get, up, to get out the vote, ran uh, phone banks and raised money. Now the vision has come back to haunt us. As you both know, firsthand, our persuasive arguments have been disregarded and met with stonewall by the White House and the pertinent agencies. This is especially stinging because other stakeholders have repeatedly received successful interpretations of their respective grievances. Most disconcerting, of course, it is last. In last week's huge accommodation, the employer's community extended uh, the statutory mandate December 31, 2013 deadline to the employer's mandate. Then comes the threat. Time is running out. Congress vote this law. We voted for you. We have a problem, and you need to fix it. This is just with our health care, but this, you know, Obamacare, in my, in my opinion, is the end of our economy as we know it. And people need to get on board and start, start calling up your senators, you know, writing letters, kick Obamacare out because it's the end of our health coverage. If you have a family, that makes it very important. My next point I'm going to talk about is um, yeah, in, in Obamacare they have death panels. Well, what's a death panel? Glad you asked. The death panel uh, happens to be, basically since all health coverage is regulated now, you're being forced to pay for it 
for coverage, whether you want it or not. If you're a senior citizen over a certain age and you need a life life-saving operation, anything, you have to go in front of a death panel to plead in front of, what, seven to eight people for your life. Because if they don't approve the surgery that you need to save it, you're not going to get it, even though you're forced to pay for it. It is, it is what it is. Um, I'm going to play for you about a ten minute, ten minute presentation of uh, a video from the John Birch Society, which really sums up very well, um, basically, the law that, that is written in the Constitution as far as being a limited republic government. Okay, and, because when I say, you know, as Sheriff of Allegheny County, I'm not going to let federal agencies step into the county to take over our rights. I'm not saying all government's bad. We absolutely need government, to, otherwise you're not going to have private property. This, I'm going to do about a 10 and a half, 15 minute video of something from the John Birch Society that um, just really sums up the difference between a dictatorship, an oligarchy, a republic, and anarchy. So everything is, is understood because it, it's just about, it, it's a very simple case of proportions, you know? It's like you need to have... Uh, you know, a certain amount of discipline, but not too much. And it's, it's, it's a very, very simple, very informative <coughs> video. It'll just take me uh, one second. But anyway, uh, as I'm queuing this up, does anybody have questions? Anybody have questions? idea that's getting started of uh, a group of 25 to 50 independent volunteers of uh, just people asking questions. Um, the common law grand jury is just basically people that, that want to uh, hold the government accountable and there's a lot of legislation that gives them teeth to do so. Um, I'm working with the common law grand jury to support everything that the common law grand jury in Allegheny County does. It's also opening up in Westmoreland County. Uh, we got Butler County Beaver. and Beaver. And um, Lawrence County. Lancaster. Lancaster, and I think Armstrong too. Working on, working on Armstrong. And uh, one of the best things that you could possibly do to start making differences, differences right now in your government is to ask questions, get involved, um, join a common law grand jury, or at least put the sheriff's feet to the fire. But uh, frankly, uh, you know, our, our government gets worse and worse and more, to, you know more oppressive as it goes on, basically because people would rather be watching football right now than in here <laughs> taking care of your government, your money, your health care, your children, um, and your family. And that, that's where society gets worse because people just don't care. It's, and historically, every time, uh, a, 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 um, throughout history, any time a great civilization has ever uh, uh, flourished, it always gets lazy, decadent, and then it goes away because people just let it go. So the best thing you can do is to start getting involved and in just asking questions. This next video, this video that I'm going to be playing, really sums it up very nicely. Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin Franklin exited the Constitutional Convention. He was asked by a woman, Sir, what have you given us? His immediate response was, A republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. Yet most Americans today have been persuaded that our nation's governmental system is a democracy and not a republic. The difference between these two is essential in understanding Americanism and the American system. 
Before we discuss political systems, however, it's helpful to address the confusion that has been spread about the political spectrum. Many have been led to believe that the political spectrum places groups such as communists on the far left, fascists or dictators on the far right, and political moderates or centrists in the middle. However, a more accurate political spectrum will show government having zero power on the far right to having 100% power on the far left. At the extreme right, there is no government. The extreme left features total government under such labels as communism, socialism, Nazism, fascism, princes, potentates, dictators, kings, any form of total government. Those who claim that Nazis and fascists are right-wing never define their terms. This amounts to spreading confusion. Toward the middle of the political spectrum can be found the type of government limited to its proper role of protecting the rights of the people. That's where the Constitution of the United States is. Those who advocate such a form of government are really constitutional moderates. So let's analyze the basic forms of government. They are monarchy or dictatorship ruled by one, oligarchy ruled by a few, democracy ruled by a majority, republic ruled by law, and anarchy which is ruled by no one. In discussing these five, we'll see that they can be narrowed down to even fewer. Looking first at monarchy or dictatorship, this form of government doesn't really exist in the practical sense. It's always a group that puts one of its members up front. A king has his council of nobles or earls, and every dictator has his bureaucrats or commissars, the men behind the scenes. This isn't ruled by one, even though one person may be the visible leader. It's ruled by a group. So let's eliminate monarchy, dictatorship, because it never truly exists. Oligarchy, which is ruled by a group, is the most common form of government in all history. And it is the most common form of government today. Most of the nations of the world are ruled by a powerful few. And therefore, oligarchy remains. At the other end, we find anarchy, which means without government. Some people have looked over history and found that many of its worst crimes were committed by governments. So they decided that having no government might be a good idea. But this is a mistake, because as the ancient Greeks stated, without law there can be no freedom. Our founding fathers agreed and held that some amount of government is a necessary force in any civilized, orderly society. In a state of anarchy, however, everyone has to guard life, liberty, and property, and the lives of family members. Everyone must be armed, and movement is severely restricted because one's property has to be protected at all times. Civilized people have always hired someone to do the guarding, a sheriff, a police force, or some branch of government. Once law enforcement was in place, the people were freer. They could leave their property, work in the fields, and so on. In short, the proper amount of government makes everyone freer. There are some who advocate anarchy, however, not because they want no government, but because they don't like what they have. They use anarchy as a tool for revolutionary change. The condition of anarchy is very much like a vacuum where something rushes in to fill it. These calculating anarchists work to break down the existing government with rioting, killing, looting, and terrorism. Tragically, the people living in such chaos often go to those best able to put an end to it and beg them to take over and restore order. And who is best able to put an end to the chaos? The very people who started it. The anarchists who created the problem then created government run by them, an oligarchy where they have total power. This is exactly what happened in Russia that led to Lenin taking total power, and in Germany where Hitler's brown shirts created the chaos that brought him to power. But anarchy isn't a stable form of government. It's a quick transition from something that exists to something desired by the power hungry. It's a temporary condition, and because it isn't permanent, we eliminate it as well. The word democracy comes from two Greek words, demos, meaning people, and kratian, meaning to rule. Democracy, therefore, means the rule of the people, majority rule. This, of course, sounds good, but suppose the majority decides to take away one's home, or business, or children. Obviously, there has to be a limit. The flaw in democracy is that the majority isn't restrained. If more than half the people can be persuaded to want something in a democracy, they rule. What about republic? 
Well, that comes from the Latin. Res meaning thing, and publica meaning public. It means the public thing, the law. A true republic is one where the government is limited by law, leaving the people alone. America's founders had a clean slate to write on. They could have set up an oligarchy. In fact, there were some who wanted George Washington to be their king. But the founding fathers knew history, and they chose to give us the rule of law in a republic, not the rule of a majority in a democracy. Why? Let's demonstrate the difference in the setting of the Old West. Consider a lynch mob in a democracy. 35 horseback riders chase one lone gunman. They catch him and they vote 35 to 1 to hang him. Democracy has triumphed, and there's one less gunman to contend with. Now consider the same scenario in a republic. The 35 horseback riders catch the gunman and vote 35 to 1 to hang him, but the sheriff arrives, and he says, you can't kill him, he's got his right to a fair trial. So they take the gunman back to town. The jury of his peers is selected, and they hear the evidence and the defense, and they decide if he shall hang. Does the jury even decide by majority rule? No, it has to be unanimous or he goes free. The rights of the government aren't subject to majority rule, but to the law. This is the essence of a republic. Many Americans would be surprised to learn that the word democracy does not appear in the Declaration of Independence or the U.S. Constitution. Nor does it appear in any of the constitutions of the 50 states. The founders did everything they could to keep us from having a democracy. James Madison, rightly known as the father of the Constitution, wrote in essay number 10 of the Federalist Papers, democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been in short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. Alexander Hamilton agreed and he stated, we are a Republican government. Real liberty is never found in despotism or in the extremes of democracy. Samuel Adams, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, stated, Democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. The founders had good reason to look upon democracy with contempt because they knew that the democracies in the early Greek city-states produced some of the wildest excesses of government imaginable. In every case, they ended up with mob rule, then anarchy, and finally tyranny under an oligarchy. During that period in Greece, there was a man named Solon who urged creation of a fixed body of law not subject to majority whims. But where the Greeks never adopted Solon's wise counsel, the Romans did. Based on what they knew of Solon's laws, they created the 12 tables of the Roman law and in effect built a republic that limited government power and left the people alone. Since government was limited, the people were free to produce with the understanding that they could keep the fruits of their labor. In time, Rome became wealthy and the envy of the world. In the midst of plenty, however, the Roman people forgot what freedom entailed. They forgot that the essence of freedom is the proper limitation of government. When government power grows, people freedom recedes. Once the Romans dropped their guard, power-seeking politicians began to exceed the powers granted them in the Roman Constitution. Some learned that they could elect politicians who would use government power to take property from some and give it to others. Agriculture subsidies were introduced, followed by housing and welfare programs. Inevitably, taxes rose and controls over the private sector were imposed. Soon, a number of Rome's producers could no longer make ends meet, and they went on the dole. Productivity declined, shortages developed, and mobs began roaming the streets, demanding bread and circuses from the government. Many were induced to trade freedom for security. Eventually, the whole system came crashing down. They went from a republic to a democracy and ended up with an oligarchy under a progression of the Caesars. Thus, democracy itself is not a stable form of government. Instead, it is the gradual transition from limited government to the unlimited rule of an oligarchy. Knowing this, we as Americans are ultimately left with only two choices. We can keep our republic, as Franklin put it, or we will inevitably end up with an oligarchy 
the tyranny of the elite. All right, I think that about sums it up pretty well. The whole thing is about a balance of power, a balance of power, the Constitution to, to ensure that anybody that's a human being, it's a person, has certain rights. Your freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of uh, the right to keep and bear arms, the uh, right to a feeding spare trial, um, all the way up, all the way up to the Tenth Amendment, the basic ten. So we have. Uh, that's one. That's my primary uh, issues for running for sheriff is to support that. <laughs> um, what we have today, you know, uh, to be quite honest, is uh, a little bit disturbing. We have up in Squirrel Hill just yesterday. I'm not making this up, but uh, they're actually ticketing people in Squirrel Hill for drive parking on their own driveway. They are, yeah, I have it right here. My, my computer works. Is that a question? I have a question. Yeah, speak up. How is your uh, view of the duties of the uh, sheriff different from those of the present sheriff? Okay, my, my views as far as the, the sheriff that are different, I'm glad you asked, is uh, some of the things I'm going to be doing more specifically. Um, there's about a current two-month wait for uh, license to carry and renewals. It's generally, a lot of people have, have been complaining it's over the 45-day waiting period. Under the Crimes Code, Title 18, uh, the, the maximum time that the sheriff has to conduct an investigation to issue license to carry is 45 days. If he can do it in 45 days, that person has to have their license to carry. It used to be instant. It used to be instantaneous. Um, all it takes is one 15-minute phone call, and the only reason is because all you got to do is check for felony charges. If I'm sheriff of Allegheny County, I will not p make people wait a single day to get their license to carry. It's going to be instant. When they come through the door, all, that, all that's required is one phone call to check for felony charges, and in 15 minutes, you'll be out the door. Another thing that, that, that's going to be different, uh, I want to streamline communications with the police scanner codes. There's a lot of confusion as far as if one municipality can't communicate with the other municipality and say they're, they're in progress for a hot pursuit. There, there's so much room for confusion that only the Allegheny County Sheriff can actually fix. What he can do is standardize and systematize the scanner codes for anybody that's in the county. So it basically be on one dispatch call and then you could uh, have the, the, uh, the central send it out to whatever lo local geographic region that they're in so that it you can take about 300% uh, of the scanners, the, the different varieties of codes, and just get it down to about maybe five primary ones. That would, that would increase services, increase communication, and save lives. It's just very simple stuff. It's just not necessarily easy. Um, another thing that I want to do is uh, I, want, I would like to take some things to uh, the court level as far as streamlining the local county police in with the sheriff's office. And Kim Stauffer and I talked on this, that it would, I mean, it would, ba it would basically take the Allegheny counties who are operating under the commissioner for the commissioner's directions. These agencies are appointed by the commissioner. That's a problem because what needs to happen is that every municipality, every police officer needs to ultimately be held accountable to the sheriff because the sheriff is elected by the people. This is the Constitution's way of keeping a, a, a police force in check ultimately by the people. Okay? For the same thing. This isn't hard to imagine either because when you think about the President of the United States being head of the executive branch, the President of the United States, who may or may never have served a day in the military, is ultimately the Commander-in-Chief of the military. And he is elected by the people every four years. So that President um, is in charge of an entire military force. You don't want a military force that's not ultimately accountable by the people. What would happen if a bunch of guys with guns, tanks, and ICBMs just weren't accountable by the people? <laughs> you know. It, it's a natural check and balance of the Constitution. And at the, at the county level, the executive branch is the police force. The, the commander-in-chief, so to speak, is the sheriff. He's elected on by the people. A lot of the municipalities, they're not elected on by anybody, but they're appointed by the commissioner or 
or somebody else, and that's, that's not right either. The whole point is that everybody needs to have a natural check and balance in the government, and all this stuff is not being checked. It's not being balanced. When things are unbalanced, you have things like um, parking authority par uh, writing tickets to people that are parking in their own driveways in Squirrel Hill. Um, I have a video, uh, video after video, it's just you know, hard to talk and do the computer at the same time. And all of it works so much better whenever you're not on the spot. But <laughs> Pittsburgh homeowners receive tickets. <coughs> just so you guys know, I'm not making this up. This is only about a minute. I just want you to know that everything I say is all documented, the information's there. And you can find it too if you just do a little bit of uh, research. Go down to your seat, I think it's flashing. You might get like a 30 second Walmart commercial here, just so you know, I don't endorse Walmart. <laughs> and if they have it, so help me, I'm going to mute it. But It's just not coming up. But uh, there's people getting ticketed up. Just take my word for it. <laughs> the information's there. Yeah. You saw it? What'd you yes. see? They say we're walking around, walking in the driveways, ticketing folks. Yeah, what needs to happen is those people need to be arrested. Those, pe those people have absolutely no right telling you that you can't park on your own driveway after you've already paid property tax, <coughs> income tax, state tax, federal tax, sales tax, inheritance tax. There's, it, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Aren't those officers also trespassing? Yes, and they're trespassing, which means the sheriff of the county, whose job it is to enforce the, exec, the executive branch and the Constitution, it doesn't say anything in there, by the way, in the Constitution, it doesn't say anything in there about the sheriff needing permission from the Supreme Court. It doesn't say anything in there about the sheriff needing permission from anybody. His job, as you saw in the video of the Wild West, which I love because I spent a year in Texas, that it's ultimately he's the only, he has no boss. You're his boss. The people are his boss because every four years you put him in there, which is the whole point of it. Uh, and he doesn't need permission from anybody. Uh, Bill Mullen, I wish you would please, you know, stop stop people from getting ticketed in their own driveways. Um, I'd also love to challenge Bill Mullen to a debate. Uh, an offer was sent out on the Post Gazette two days ago. I don't know if he received it yet. Um, I'd, love to, I'd love to have a debate with them. If not, we'll have a shootout maybe. <laughs> Who doesn't want that? <laughs> Seriously. Uh, questions? Yeah, Mike. Yes. Uh, yeah, we're in the process of uh, handling a common law grand jury in Alameda County. The yeah. people voted to reinstate uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, my question to you is if you were presented, uh, if you were brought a presentment, Yes. Uh, on the of grand jury, would, you would I indict him yet? Yeah, would you Absolutely. present it to the uh, prosecutor? I would present, I would present it to the... Tell him to uh, proceed? To do his job. For, for the people? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, whole point, the whole point of why society collapses over time, just like what happened in Rome, is that as, uh, as a free society flourished, people just got lazy, and within about two generations, that slack off. The mafia, so to speak, would end up taking things through threats, and then just it would be a downward spiral until basically the bottom would fall out. And it all comes down to people caring. Um, in Rome, the Colosseum was a big thing, and gladiators were the big thing because that was the entertainment of the day. And all that, that is in Pittsburgh is a, that, that's all. All that is is a distraction. We got three. We got Heinz Field, PNC Park, and uh, Consul Energy Center that was built with tax money 
Uh, there was an election to have whether or not we wanted stadiums, and we voted it down. They built it anyway. <laughs> and if you laugh about it, that's about a half of a billion dollars that we're paying for it. When we still owe 30 million yeah, on Three Rivers. We still owe 30 million dollars the day that Three Rivers Stadium was blown up. We're, st we're still paying on that. At what point does it stop, and why hasn't anybody gone to jail over that? If anybody, one of you stole twenty dollars, stole like five dollars by the end of the night, you'd be in jail. Right. What about a half a billion dollars? What about uh, you were telling me the other day about where we at, where we're at is on the most heavily taxed in the country? Oh yeah. Um, another point. I'm not even going to get into the computer, but <laughs> I did my research on that too um, on Forbes website, and. Uh, I'm going to look a little, we're either number 127 or 107, to give you an idea, of the highest tax county in the United States of America. Okay? There's a, just over 3,000 counties in the United States of America. We're in like the top 5% of highest tax counties in the United States of America. Why is that? The reason why, I'll answer it, is because we've been run, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania has been run primarily by the Democratic Party for at least 80 years. Okay? Um, for 80 years, the Democratic Party has been running it, racking the bills up, and nothing's going to change. If you want to change anything, what you got to do is you got to get a new person in office of, of a different party, but specifically the sheriff's spot, because when somebody's doing what they're not supposed to be, he's the guy that can arrest them. Now, on that note, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. And I will. There's, a, there's plenty of room in Allegheny County Jail. So, so instead of taking the mayor of Pittsburgh, no, I'm not going to let the mayor of Pittsburgh pay for other people's lap dances, and when he does, he's going to jail. And, and I don't need a Supreme Court's permission, I don't need a judge's permission, I don't need the blessing of anybody but you people. Another thing, DUI checkpoints, okay? DUI checkpoints... And, all, and it's a complete violation of the Fourth Amendment. It's a Nazi-style checkpoint. And I'm going to say it because it is. If you have to stop and you're not prohibited from the freedom of travel, which in many states is a constitutional right, not so much Pennsylvania, by orders of the Supreme Court, the only person that could stop that would be a sheriff of Allegheny County. And that's exactly what needs to happen because when somebody gets pulled over for a DUI, now you're not supposed to drink and drive. Okay? But... What right does the state have to stop people from freely traveling because they drank, so help me God, one beer in, in, in a free world, and then they get a $3,000 fine for it, their car impounded, and possible jail time on their first offense? That has nothing to do with public safety. It has, it has, it's all about money, and it's all about control. And the police are supposed to be there to protect and serve people, to protect and serve. It says so on the side of their squad car, okay? But it doesn't say who they're protecting and serving. Corporation. They're not protecting and serving us, okay? And the one way to hold them accountable is to keep them accountable to a sheriff who is elected by the people so that they're ultimately accountable to the people of the United States. Good, Mike. Oh, and I get more fired up the more I talk about it. You got my vote. Another question. Yes. You have to take an oath of office, and I'm pretty sure you know what that means. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, everybody knows what their oath of office is. They don't remember it. So I, I guess the reason why I'm running for the Constitution Party, so help me God, is to remind people of what their job they already sworn an oath to uphold and defend on is. If they can't remember it, I'm right here. Read it. It's, it's there. You know, I'm not making this up. Um, but they're supposed to be there to protect and serve people so that people have private property not taken away through cita needless citations, uh, traffic tickets, um, they're supposed to be there to protect and to help. And th even 30 years ago they did that. They would help you. If they pulled you over for, for drunk driving, they would take you home so that you got home safe. Not impound your vehicle and send you thousands of dollars in fines. Um, Isn't it more or less a way to search your vehicle unwarranted? Yes, it is. And the number one reason, the number one excuse that police just love to say of why we got to search your car is to find drugs. Okay, and, and, and all that the drug war is about anymore is not one more excuse to, vi to completely violate your Fourth Amendment right to private property without a warrant. 
Okay? I can't just go up to somebody and say, hey, uh, let me search your purse, your car, your, your child, your... Like, I'm looking for drugs. Don't worry. It's, it's for your own good. It's not. It's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. And a lot of time, time after time, is the people that get caught distributing the drugs in large amounts get off scot-free because that's where all the money is. And the problem with our police force is that they're going after people on, on minor drug offenses for, for usage when, they, when they're not going after and generally turning a complete blind eye to the, the dis distribution end, which is, where, which is where the money is. And that's why they're turning a blind eye to it. As Sheriff of Allegheny County, I'm not going to let that happen. And I'm not going to let police violate your Fourth Amendment rights as an excuse to look for drugs. Okay. Yes? Well, that looks like in West Fulton County, New Kensington is probably the worst drug town in the county. Yeah. Our district attorney knows all the people in New Kensington because that's where he's from. But somehow it's the worst drug town, even though the district attorney lives there. I'm not saying. <laughs> All right. And one more point I'm going to make. This will go up. All right. Now, I'm going to give you a brief history of the sheriff, about well, the Allegheny County Sheriff's Office. Okay? Because this is pretty eye. This is pretty eye opening. Uh, the first sheriff of Allegheny County was James Morrison of 1789. Okay. <coughs> From 1789 to 1956, sheriffs have only been in office for less than four years. Uh, James Morrison, 1789 to 92, that's three years. Um, Samuel Ewald, 92 to 95, three years. The next one, James Sample, 95 to 98, three years. Ephraim Jones, 98 to 01, three years. The list goes on and on and on. The average sheriff is only supposed to be in office for like no more than two terms, but every single sheriff in Allegheny County since 1954, maybe except for like one, has been less than four years, not even a full term. And the reason why is because you're not supposed to have career politicians in office because generally the longer that they're in there, the more stuff they get into. Um, when we get, these are all sheriffs, less than, less than two or three years, all the way on until we get to right here, William H. Davis of 19, or 1954. 1954 to 2013 to present, we've only had four sheriffs, and they've all been Democratic Party. That says it right there. Why are we on the on the top 100, the top five percent of heavily taxed counties in the United States of America? Because the same party has been in office for 80 years, and nobody's doing anything about it. Nobody's changing things up. Nobody's getting new people in there. There, there are people that have been in there for 20 years. And if I'm the only person that's challenged an incumbent sheriff in 60 years, why would they leave? It's a great job, they, you know. You gotta, you gotta put their feet to the fire, and this is how you do it. That's the history of Allegheny County sheriffs. My name is Mike Satelli. I'm running for it. Right. I'm gonna go one last round on anybody that has questions. But while we have questions, we still have amazing raffle prizes on the side for a 50-50. Uh, Barnes & Noble Nook, 16-inch HD plus. And uh, lottery tickets, anybody. This is your last chance to get more lottery tickets. Go see the front. While I entertain questions, any questions? Dave? Uh, I think I know the answer, but if uh, the Department of Homeland Security dangled a bunch of money and or nice military hardware out there, uh, what would your position be on whether or not you would accept it or not? You're going to jail for bribery. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what? I got a message. I got a message for every county sheriff of Allegheny County, okay? If you let the Department of Homeland Security in Allegheny County because you think you're their friend, maybe maybe they like you, maybe they bought you a nice shirt, maybe they took you out for a fancy dinner and called you special, okay? They are not your friend, okay? And if you let them in Allegheny County, okay, you're making a big mistake because they have absolutely no right being in Allegheny County, okay? Uh, the Department of Homeland Security was started after the world uh, after 9/11 to fight terrorism. Okay? Does anybody know how many terrorists the TSA, under the Department of Homeland Security, captured since uh, since 9/11? Zero. 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 We're paying hundreds of billions of dollars, billions of dollars, get one yet, Mike. to the Department of Homeland Security. Odds are in their favor. Odds are in their favor. Okay, so it's either one of two things. Either one, they're not there for Homeland Security. Or two, they absolutely are terrible at their job. 
Either way, through fraud, waste, and abuse, they absolutely need to go, and they have no right taking more taxpayer money for not capturing any bad guys. That money can be used for, for the community, it can be used for local government. Yes? Uh, I read an article recently about uh, certain police departments that had quotas. Yeah. They had to have so many arrests. You brought that up. Yeah, uh, how would you deal with that? Okay, I just read an article. This was like two days ago. I believe it was in either Mississippi or Missouri. I'm not going to, like, don't hold me to it unless I can pull it up on screen because my computer ain't working. But there's municipalities out there that have to write 150, like if they have a population of 50,000 people in their municipality, have to write 75,000 tickets in one year. That's an average of one and a half citation per person, whether they did anything or not. And the reason why it has nothing to do with the protection and service of, of, of helping people, it's all about money. And, and, and that's, all it's, that's all it's about. It's, it's just about money. And they're hiring more police officers to write more tickets. But um, did, anybody, who, did anybody get a speeding ticket this week? Did anybody get a, get a speeding ticket within a month? Did anybody go within six months? Did anybody get a speeding ticket? You got a speeding ticket? How much was it? Okay, when you've got that $175 speeding ticket, at any point, were you absolutely thankful that you finally got your, your, your speeding ticket because you know that you're endangering people and you're, you just thank God that you finally got your speeding ticket and you can't wait to pay it because, you know, oh, you just got to get that off your chest. Did, did any of that come across your mind? No, and I didn't learn my <laughs> Well, maybe, you may be, man, you may be extreme, I don't know. Um, one more question. Do you know anybody that's gotten a speeding ticket? Any, anybody else? Okay, when, when, when that other person got a speeding ticket at any time, you might be extreme. Were they, were they happy that they got their speeding ticket? I mean, I don't know the same either. Really? <laughs> yes? Have you ever gotten a speeding ticket? I've gotten lots of speeding tickets. And there's one reason why I'm standing up here and getting so mad about speeding tickets is because it's not necessary. It has nothing to do with safety, okay? If you can't drive your car and you end up wrecking it, through literally the law of nature will eventually weed your way out from not driving anymore because then your insurance premiums go up, you can't afford it, and you just won't drive it. That's another story. Um, but it shouldn't be about having the blessing of somebody to have your permission from the state to drive down the road. But that's what the laws are for the Title 75 for the Title 75 PA code for traffic citations. Yes? Yes. The sheriff's uh, wages and yes. what, was go what he heard was going on. Would you like to tell that to the rest of the Okay. Uh, the sheriff currently makes $64,000 a year um, because he's an elected official. His deputies, he can basically name the rate that they make their wages at. And I'm trying to get information on that because it'd be really nice to know how much they're getting, but it's not really posted very well. Unless you submit maybe Freedom of Information Acts, but I know for, for elected officials you can get it right up on the website. And it'd be great to have an understanding of how much police officers make, not, not sheriffs necessarily, but all municipal police, especially the ones that do DUI checkpoints, because they make a lot more money than municipal police for, for the checkpoints and the, and the citations they get. A lot of them make over six figures. You know, and this isn't a service, that's, this is not something that we need. It's not something that people necessarily want. I don't want it as my sole vote. <laughs> you know, um, to protect private property, that needs to stop. It really needs to stop. And, and the only reason it's going on is because people are more than happy to pay, to pay $175 and even show up in court to challenge it. If every person that got a speeding ticket just showed up to court to ask questions and challenge, it costs, they'd have to raise the citation fees over 300% because of the court costs that you racked up just to show up to ask your, your accusing party uh, who testified against you what happened. Which is, you, people need to get involved and get in the game. That's as simple as it is. The problem is, is the people would rather watch football. And the Steelers aren't even doing good. I mean, this, is, this is your window because they sucked this year. <laughs> yes. I got a question on the speeding ticket. Thing. Yes. Um, I was got a speeding ticket about two years ago in the city of Pittsburgh uh, on Second Avenue. I got to court. I found out that the police officer didn't have to show up in the city of Pittsburgh. That's a lie. 
and they didn't, and I still... Uh, you have the right to face your accuser. Okay. You have the right to face your accuser. Uh, the Sixth and Seventh Amendment. You have the right to face your accuser. If he does not show up... I win. You win, but you were at a district magistrate. Yeah, I was downtown, yes. If you appealed it, you win, but then what? You got to go to court and take another day off work just to show up for the chance he may or may not show up? And it should have gotten kicked out. What was the name of the district magistrate? I don't remember. It was down the first day out in the Okay, okay, right by the county jail. Yeah. 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 As a sheriff, could you do something? Could you, could you force the city of Pittsburgh to force the officers to be there to face you know, the people there? Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. And when they don't, people can go to jail over that, and I will put them in jail for not doing their job. That's awesome. Man. <laughs> Dang, that feels good to say. <laughs> Let's say you run a stop sign and yeah. you don't injure anyone, but you still get a ticket. So who's the injured party? And you are from the ticket. Yeah, but <laughs> who are you actually? Uh, who's the injured party and whose property are you destroying? Or? Okay, with that goes, you're not. You're not under the Constitution. It's it's very simple. If there's no victim, there's no crime. Okay. No, it's a victimless crime. In, in, in my presentation with the Wild West. Like, you know, the, the, the crime was the, uh, the posse of 35 guys going after to kill the one guy. Because that's obviously a loss of life or liberty. That's why he was voting against to save his life. Um, that's where the sheriff steps in because there's, there, there's actually, that's a criminal issue, okay? Um, involving a felony of murder. Um, which is why there's a whole process of going through trial, which is what needs to happen so that you have a republic, okay? Um, as far as the tickets go under Title 75 traffic code, there is no victim. There's no crime. What happens under statutory law is that a police officer pulls you over for violating a law that a bunch of lawyers made on your private property that you already paid for in the first place. You are paying a police officer's salary for the privilege of making laws to put on public land that you paid for to write you a ticket so that you can continue paying them more money. Well, that means you're going to be some of that money. Yes. Driving tickets would... Uh, or will be going into their pension fund. And a third of it goes into their pension fund. The more tickets they write, the more money they make. Okay? What's right about that? That's a racket. It's a, it's a racket, and I can prove it in three questions. Okay? I want to use the analogy of going to an ATM and being robbed. Okay? Say you're, say you're robbed at gunpoint, or a weapon, or a threat was used to take your money that you took out of the ATM, somebody threatened you, you gave them the money. Okay? That's a felony of armed robbery. Okay? Now, if it, now this, and this is this is hypothetical because I don't make the law sheriff. I just enforce it. But just hear me out and let me get your honest opinion. Okay, when a police officer writes you a, typic, uh, a traffic citation for one hundred and seventy-five dollars, okay, you have to pay it. If you voluntarily refuse to comply with paying that citation, what happens? You get convicted. So what does that mean? What is it? What is convicted? You go to jail. How? Uh, somebody comes to your house, a constable, after a bench warrant is issued for your arrest, to take you to jail if you don't pay the fine. What if you voluntarily refuse to comply to go to jail? Exactly. At some point, a guy with a gun is going to come to your door and, and either use violence or threats of violence to get your money. Well, that sounds like extortion. Bingo. It is. We just have a really good way of so they just have a really good way of PR. Thank you, lawyers. This is what they do. You know, but, uh, you know, we need to wake up here. You know, if you just keep paying bribe money to bribe money after bribe money, any criminal is just, after they get $100, $175 off you, but they get it, next time they're going to want $200. Next time they're going to want $250. Next time they're going to want $300. The more they get, the more they want. That's the nature of criminals. And if you let it get out of hand... You get to the point where you have anarchy, and then anarchy ends up being a monarchy, people fighting. All you got to do is enforce what's already on the books right now. It's there for a reason. Any last questions? Mike? Yes? You said that uh, if you were elected sheriff, you would remind your deputies of their oath uh, of office. I want to remind every deputy of their oath of office to okay. keep would them accountable. The only... Go ahead. Yeah. And... When, when any police officer steps out of line and does something, they're going to jail. For example, uh, there's a guy, there's a lawsuit being filed right now 
uh, by a guy named Leon Ford, who was a 19-year-old kid who got pulled over in November. I'm talking like one year ago, less than technically less than one year ago. He got pulled over by city police, and uh, because he matched the description, um, the, the, the police, after detaining him for over 25 minutes, had th like two to three forms of identification of exactly who he was. They were looking for another g guy. I think his name was Leon Bryce. His name was Leon Ford. They accused him of forging documents, even though he had all the documents there. That he was well, they detained him after 25 minutes. One of the cops jumps in the back of the squad car, and I have it on video on YouTube. I can queue it up. We'll do this at the end of the meeting when I have a little bit of time to look at the computer. It's hard to do both. But this 19-year-old kid ended up getting shot in the back of the neck and paralyzed for the rest of his life. Okay? He finally got around to doing a lawsuit, a lengthy lawsuit, which may take years on end, just for him to get money. In the meantime, the police officer that did this in Zone 3, I believe, has never been suspended of pay. Uh, he got investigated, but where's the justice in that? Okay, now can you imagine police at, at, at checkpoints? I mean, in numbers, people, you know, as, as a whole, I mean, on the, like on the Discovery Channel, in numbers, people, people's IQ exponentially decreases. Like, look at football. You know, who? Roethlisberger, yeah. And then you get, like, more, more Steelers fan. But, um, what we need, yeah. The other part of my question was, will you ensure that they know what they're, precisely what they're taking their oaths to? In other words, will you require them to study and learn the U.S. Yes. and Pennsylvania Constitution. I will remind every single person of their oath of office, law enforcement, military, because that's, that's what you swore an oath to. And when you violate question. it, you go to jail. And you get held up for, for, for charges. The vast majority of, of uh, elected officials <coughs> don't even know the Constitution. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> they even say they got a lot of them. <laughs> Jim Barr is a, uh, is a good example. He uh, he went to he went to they he's running for county council district one. He got all of his signatures. He only needed 250. He got 289. Um, the Republican Party took him in uh, to court to challenge the, the signatures, and they brought an expert. They called an expert witness who was nothing more than uh, somebody that interpreted signatures, who got over 35 of his signatures kicked out based off of her opinion. You know, completely throwing out the voice of the people because they're trying to stop an election. Of, you know, a free election of, of somebody that legitimately got all of his signatures and everybody that signed it, he personally went door to door to. And he had to bring 22 people into court to show the judge that they signed. And they still tried the defense, or the prosecution still tried to question the, 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 the voters themselves that they weren't who they were. Like, are you really Dave? I think I am. Are you? You know, it, it's insanity. And, uh, you know, so this is what happens whenever, whenever you throw elections off. You know, if elections are being rigged right from the beginning, you're not going to have a free election. The whole, the whole point is it's the people's consent and the people's choice. Dave? Uh, there's some talk about um, bringing in, uh, like, not, like, about a third of the city's uh, cop cars have dash cams, but there's also, you know, the, the camera. Do you think uh, um, recording interactions with uh, the sheriff's office would protect both the uh, the department and the officers and the public? Yes. Or what's your opinion on yes. that? Yes. I, I, as public servants, all public servants need to be held accountable for everything they do at all times while in uniform, while on duty. Absolutely no questions. Cameras, cameras are that line of defense. But you have the right, you have a camera too on your smartphone, I bet. You know, you have the right to, and, and Stephen Sapal, the district attorney, uh, just supported this. If, if any police officer at any time does something that is even questionable, you have the right in, in public property and private property, as long as it's a public servant on duty to, to, uh, to uh, record what they're doing, it's their job to give you their business card and tell you their badge number. If they fail to do that, they're failing at their job. It, you can either call the their local chief of police or the sheriff. Yes? I have a follow-up to that. In some areas, not around here, but in some areas, um, wiretapping laws, uh, if there's uh, audio to the recording, um, people have been arrested um, because they you know, said, oh, yeah, there's yeah. a microphone. Would you fire a deputy um, if they arrested somebody falsely for videotaping, even when Zapala says it's, it's uh, legal? Yeah, for... Okay, what that's about, I worked as a private investigator for three years, what that's about in Pennsylvania you can't audio record somebody 
on public pro on uh, on private property unless you have consent of the owner. Um, other states are different, but public servants are public servants. Hold them accountable. You have every right to videotape, audio record, and video record what they do as pictures. public servants. Okay, and it, it just comes down to people asking questions, but. In all honesty, if somebody's not doing what they're supposed to be doing, what do they have any worried about getting recorded in the first place? All right. You know, that's what they tell you when they pull you over to search your car for drugs. If you're not doing anything wrong, what do you care if I search your car? If you're not doing anything wrong. But when they go in your car, they can find other stuff. And the next thing you know, you end up with a citation for something. And the whole story about that is we're going to throw a bunch of mud at the wall and see if it sticks. But we don't have anything, so we've got to find something. You know? And that's, that's a warrantless search in violation of the Fourth Amendment. You have every right to not let police officers search your vehicle without a search warrant, nor should you, for your protection and the police officer's protection. So um, I'll take one more question. We're running a little bit late. After this, we're going to do the raffle, and then uh, I'll be here uh, to talk to anybody after we finish up. One last question. Kim. Guest Speaker of Fire Owners Against Crime. What do you need between now and the election to help your campaign? Thank you. Uh, the one thing I need, I'm going against a system made out of time and money, and it's our money and our time, okay? But I, as a third party, have to do ten times more work to get anything done. Uh, there's three things that I need in order, in order to catapult in order to catapult myself to get into an office, into office and accomplish a true story of David versus Goliath. Votes, people, and money. <laughs> That's exactly what our government's made up of. But like everything that, um, that I do, you know, I need fire to fight fire. What I need is I'm doing a grassroots movement um, because I'm a working man. And so is everybody here. And that's exactly, and anybody that, that listens to me can relate to that. I know, otherwise I would have gotten 5,000 signatures in a month and three days just, just talking to people. I mean, that's, that's an insane amount of number. Any sheriff I've talked to, because Allegheny County is five times bigger than any county, like Greene County, 20 times bigger than Fayette County. Um, when, I, when I tell the, sheriff, the, the other sheriff's staff for the other counties, like I did a couple of days ago, they, their jaws drop. Like, the, the, uh, the one guy only needed 100 signatures. Uh, I got f 10 times more signatures than Sheriff Mullen was required to get. He only needed to get 500 signatures because he was endorsed by, uh, by um, Parties. the Democratic Party. As a third party, I didn't go through the primaries. I had to get 3,632. I ended up getting about 5,000. But, I mean, in the Constitution, it says all Article 1, Section 5, uh, all, all elections are to be free and equal. If one guy has to get 500 signatures and one guy has to get 3,652, there's nothing free or equal. But, um, but you know, I did it. I, I just did it because it's important and I got a message I want to get out. So, we're running past the time here. What I need, what I need from you is a grassroots support. I need your vote. I need you to talk to every single one of your friends, family, anybody with eyes to see and ears to hear that there's going to be a new sheriff in this town. And we got to kick the old guy. We got. There's gonna be a new sheriff in this town. Um, also, uh, contributions are much much appreciated. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm gonna be doing this entire campaign probably off of a couple thousand dollars. Um, the guy I'm going against has like literally uh, forty four thousand dollars from his committee, and then whatever he did into his personal just from the primary. I mean, he's got fifty to every bit of fifty to a hundred thousand dollars. He could buy commercials and stuff. I'm not even trying to do that. I'm just getting signs, you know. How do we get those? What's that? How can we get your signs? Uh, just get my number at, at the end, and then whenever I get my signs made up, I'll just uh, we'll just do it. Because uh, Allegheny County is 742 miles with a population of 1.2 million people. I couldn't have picked a bigger county to run for sheriff. Mike, how many people are on your campaign committee? On my campaign committee. Jim Barr. Mike, I'm sorry, you don't have a committee. You're, you're just running as a candidate. I have help. I have help. Uh, helpers. I have no official committee. Okay. <coughs> where, where I'm going with that is ask everyone in this room to be on your committee. And anybody in this room, if you'd like to be my committee and help out, I need a hand. Uh, support your sheriff. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Last call. Last Last call. call.
call for raffle prizes. Okay. We, we collected a total of 130 dollars for 50, so the winner will get 65 bucks. 65, 65 bucks. One person. Drum roll. No. <laughs> Godson. Number. Okay, we got number 464-699, last name Godson. All right. Come collect your prize. All right, two more prizes. One is for 14 lottery tickets, a $25 gift card, and a microphone guitar for, for your children. The big one being the Barnes and Noble Nook. Okay, these are the white tickets. Nice. The white tickets is the uh, this is twenty five dollar gift card, uh, fifteen dollar uh, fifteen dollars worth of lottery tickets, and a rocket ribbon thing uh, over there. All right, white ticket number two six six four zero three. Last name Hope. <laughs> okay, also, uh, before I before I, I, I auction off the last one, we have free DVDs over here. Uh, educational DVDs from everything. Common Law Grand Jury, uh, 21, we all have stuff. Okay, and I want to explain it. Uh, the Common Law Grand Jury is just, like I said, the, a bunch of 25 to 50 independent investigators asking questions. One of the best things you can do. Uh, you know, but just organize, get behind it. Um, you said Agenda 21? We got stuff on Agenda 21. Agenda 21. On the Federal Reserve. We got the Federal Reserve, a privately owned bank that prints your money and controls your money through debt. The very reason why our money is working against us. You need to at least understand who owns the Federal Reserve since you're a slave. You're working for it. Every single, every single uh, dollar that you earn is being controlled. With, it's not backed by gold or silver. The international banks like J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs charge interest on it. Bill. Or, yeah. or Jim Hart. Mike, we have... Overview of America, the video that you showed a caption of. The half an the hour video that I was watching, one, yeah. the, 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 that right I showed here. for everybody, was only, I only played 10 minutes of it. That 10 minutes accurately broke down. I mean, it, it's so simple. Anybody can understand it. Those videos are being here for free. This is an educational school. Think of it as a school class, right? But you're actually going to be able, this is actually information that you can use. It's going to help you out. And it's free. I mean, where else do you get this? <laughs> Last chance for Barnes and Noble Nook. Who would rather really be watching the Steelers? Who would rather be watching the Steelers right now? Nobody. 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 <laughs> ben Roethlisberger can throw a pigskin ball to himself. He's, he makes more money. Ben Roethlisberger makes more money in one year than you will in a lifetime of your hard labor. In my in my civilian job, I'm the primary person that puts food on people's tables so they can go to Giant Eagle to eat. How important is it to eat? Very important. But I'm not making $10 million a year. And then, and then in the Air Force Reserve, I protect America on the weekends. <laughs> Who cares about Ben Roethlisberger? There's people, soldiers dying for $50,000 a year getting shot. And more people would rather watch Ben Roethlisberger or, the, you know, a hockey game. Shame on them. All right, and then the last grand prize. Ashley, would you like your son to pick the grand prize winner? All right, we have we have a special guest here that we brought in for your entertainment for the grand prize to auction off a Barnes and Noble Nook, a uh, 16 gigabyte Bluetooth enabled, a really nice tablet. You can watch video games, uh, do movies, surf the web. This is the grand prize to be picked. Okay, hold on. This is the red ticket. Everybody has their red ticket in there, right? Right. Yes. By Cable Kettle. Caleb 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 
Pick it up. Picking winners is very exciting sometimes. Tell them don't touch them. Stressful. Tell them don't touch them. Don't touch. Hey, stop that. <laughs> There's a goldfish in it. They're cookies. They're cookies. Oh, Bobby's ticket. Grab them. Grab them.